Anyway, dude, it's uh, it's showtime, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm greeting. ready. I'll... Greetings, everybody. I'll just turn it over to you. Oh, yeah. I'll get out of his way. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, this is the follow-on from uh, basically explaining uh, my introductory course on quantum computing, which is called What Makes Quantum Computers So Special? And <clears throat> I'd like to um, just sort of do a quick recap. What I did on, I can't remember what day it was, it must have been Thursday or Friday uh, of last week, I explained the first, there were eight chapters and I explained the first three which were on quantum physics per se. So they were introducing the new person to quantum entanglement, superpositioning, and to a lesser extent, but no less important, quantum tunneling. And uh, they were all about 20 minutes each, all of those lectures, because it's the fundamental law of the universe, never mind the fundamental law of quantum computing. It's, it underlies, underpins everything that happens in the quantum realm. So, um, you know, the block sphere is merely superposition uh, or the ability to um, uh, do the superposition. I always hate it when people say, even experts in our field will say, um, a, a bit is on or off and a qubit is uh, one or zero or one and zero at the same time. I hate that expression because it, it um, underemphasizes what's really going on. I always say it's one and zero and everything in between, which is what's covered in the blog sphere. So I'll very quickly recap uh, on, on, on those uh, issues so that nobody's you know, left behind. And then today I'll go over the remaining five chapters, which are short, sharp introductions to what someone needs to know at the quantum level uh, for quantum computing. So uh, I go over qubits and linear algebra and I'll explain uh, those things. And then at the end I've added Anyone who's written a course or anyone who's written a manual or anything like that will know that as soon as you write it, it's out of date. Especially this part, the, you know, the quantum physics part hasn't changed much, but the quantum computing certainly has. And uh, so I, I've added at the end, which I think you'll really like, um, three issues that I would certainly include in uh, the course, if I ever do, which I will, update um, this course, especially um, on Shaw's algorithm. Shaw's algorithm has taken a dynamic leap in the past 12 months with a new algorithm called um, by Smolin, Smith, and Volkov, or Volkov, something like that, um, and it's exponentially increased shores. So that's very exciting for the industry and for what we're doing. And it shows that even though a pure quantum computer is still a good way off, like anything in life, we can tweak things so that we can improve our results by being clever rather than waiting for the technology to be there. So, again, I'd like to say I've targeted the course at students who are just starting out on their journey. I wanted to, to make it exciting and mysterious, which is great with, in the quantum physics because that's exactly what quantum physics is. It's exciting and mysterious. We're, we've known about it for 100 years and we're, we're not much further down the track of understanding what's going on with entanglement, etc. And I try to start my lectures, or, or I try to make them engaging and easy to understand. There's an awful lot to understand in, the, in quantum computing, 
<coughs> excuse me. So um, today and in the computing section, short, sharp, to talk about the subject, give it an overview so that the uh, student will get an idea of what's going on. There were eight chapters, 183 minutes of uh, video, and then at each chapter I have a quiz. I put in research links, which are really important because it's the YouTubes and the white papers that I have chosen. And then on the course, there is an area where we can chat and discuss uh, anything the student wants to discuss, basically. So as I say, on, oh, it was on Friday, we had the session one where we went over the mysteries and beauty of uh, quantum mechanics. I might add, uh, so the double slit experiment, uh, you should sort of know about because that's where we first understood what was happening with superposition. But I also went to another experiment that as a quantum computing student, you should know about which is the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment, which sounds like a mouthful and it looks like a mouthful, but um, it really is just a double slit with entangled particles. But it, it, it proved that events that have already happened can be altered. And again, this is, uh, this is bringing up the mysterious side of quantum physics, which is all true. So then the five chapters, I'll introduce, you know, Richard Feynman's concept of quantum computing. So here's the course. I'll click the link in a second, but I'll just go over each chapter. So uh, the introduction was 46 minutes and it's, it went over the course, what you're going to learn, what you need to know, and, and what the potential of quantum computing is. Chapter two, was what I call the holy trinity of quantum physics, quantum entanglement, superposition, and tunneling. And then I gave a brief history of classical computers uh, because classical, as we all know, is completely different to quantum, totally. Um, it's a paradigm shift, so I go over that. Okay, so now here's Chapter four is the beginning of the quantum computing side of things. So I went over uh, subatomic uh, electron orbitals. So, I mean, basically quantum computing is worked out from how far the electron is from the nucleus in, in superposition and when it is actually a, a, a particle of thing, an electron. So <clears throat> it's worked out, I always say to students and anyone I'm talking to, that the, co the computation side of quantum computing is at an atomic level. Um, and paradoxically, the digital Moore's law type computing has reached its zenith its peak it can't carry on not just because we can't fit more chips in although even that's difficult but the reason why is that the um, space between the chips the, the transistors if you like is so small that quantum tunneling takes place now quantum tunneling is like the walking through walls and what it sort of means is the, in, in, in super digital computers of today, quantum tunneling is ruining the actual data you know, and the computation. So in, in a strange way, quantum physics is stopping the pro, halting the progress of the super digital computers. So I talk about Boolean logic. Boolean just means that there's a yes or no, true or false time answer. And then speak about probability and the difference that that brings in. Complex and imaginary numbers. Um, uh, Terrell's done a great uh, webinar on this, but I, I mention it just in a way of saying um, 
this is what they are and this is what you sort of need to know and and really a lot of the course is a case of don't be scared of these things imaginary numbers merely the square root of minus one and a complex number really is just a combination of real numbers and imaginary numbers <coughs> so excuse me so it's it's nothing to be scared of and you just need to understand it and I think it's important when you do new quantum computing to augment that with a bit of uh, linear algebra. I then talk about the qubit and then multiple qubits. So I get into gates and algorithms. Um, and I, this is where I give them short sharp. You can see they're all just about three to six minutes each. And I talk about Deutsch's problem, um, and I will expand on, uh, on that at the end, because I think Deutsch's problem, which is misspelled there, I've got an E at the end, and I don't think it's got an E, but Deutsch's problem is the fundamental basis of why a quantum computer is not only much, much faster than a super digital computer because it's exponential rather than linear, but it can also truly <coughs> do multiple processes at once. So whereas the digital world has to um, take a number of processes, uh, quantum computing actually takes less besides being quicker, so I mentioned that. Uh, and I wanted to introduce the student to Shores and Grovers. And then I talk about the types of qubit, topological. I talk about the Majorana fermion, which uh, I'll, I'll speak of in this uh, lecture, which is uh, the Majorana fermion may or may not be the key to everything because it is a fermion. A fermion is just a, a, a subatomic category. So it includes anything with, with quarks inside it. There are six quarks, which <clears throat> are the up, down, the top, bottom, and the strange charm quarks that have been, um, you know, uh, they were postulated in the 60s and proven. I'm, I'm trying to remember who actually discovered the quark. Um, oh, the name escapes me at the moment, but it's a fundamental part. So fermions is just matter. Um, neutrons and protons are fermions, and all baryons are uh, fermions. But the Majorana actually is a particle that has its own antiparticle, so it never touches each other. And Tara, are you going to call out the questions? Or if, if there's any question that you think you want to interrupt me with, just do so. Because I, I won't uh, check the question myself. I think you can unmute yourself and ask a question. I don't know whether I should. Uh, oh, let's go, never mind. Um, and then I mentioned, um, which is something I probably wouldn't do now, but I mentioned the flip flop qubit simply because that's a qubit that's been perfected in Australia. It's the silicon spin, basically, out of uh, the University of New South Wales. And then, again, just three minutes each on Microsoft and IBM, what they're doing. And all I wanted to convey here was that IBM has a real quantum computer, the Q experience, that you can actually go on now and program. And that's something that amazes people it amazed me at first so I make sure that they realize that I don't go into kiss it or anything like that because it, this wasn't what the course was about and then I talk about Microsoft the Q shop <coughs> excuse me and having uh, a simulation of a quantum computer that you could play with and these are the, what I'm calling here, the additional discussions, which I'll get to today, um, which I think are really important to look at. So the Majorana, 
uh, which I'll talk about, Deutsch's problem, and also Shaw's algorithm, but not Shaw's as in the, what we're used to. Uh, we've always been told that Shaw's is years and years away. I mean, up until 2014, Shaw's, the, the greatest uh, number that we could factor was 21, seven times three. And I'll talk about factoring when I get to this. And <clears throat> even at, um, but on, at 2020 at the Q2B uh, conference, that number there, which is um, a billion, billion, no, it's a million, million, so it's, a, it's a, a thousand billion, depending on the American way, or in English, it's actually a billion, one billion, 1.09 billion. But anyway, that number's been factored. But the important thing is, there's a new compiler to Shores, and that's the Small and Smith and Vargo compiler. Now, it's really changing everything because it's exponentially increasing the power of Shores. So I will show you, I'll give you those links which are beneath um, Shaw, uh, Small and Smith and Vargo, and they'll show the actual paper where now we have factored a 20,000 digit, I think it's 20,000 digit number. So it's very, very exciting. But let me go to the course now, and I'll just take you through some of the items in the final five chapters, and then we'll go to the new discussion points to make it interesting for you. Okay, so this is where we go to the course. Um, it tells you where you're up to, and you merely just click on there, and here are all of the chapters that I um, uh, have just been over. Actually, what I'm going to have to do so that you can hear the sound, I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, So let us start by going to, uh, I, we can talk quickly about the subatomic electron orbitals. So if I click that, Let me share my screen. Oh, well, that's what I wanted to do. Um, share the computer sound. So you should be able to hear the sound now if I go to give me a second. Okay, so I'm not sure whether the sound's coming through there. So here's all the chapters that I was referring to before. And we can just go to uh, any not, one of them. Which one can we... I'm sorry? It is not coming through. Uh, okay, thanks for that. Well, we don't need, really need to go into the actual video that I'm showing, but here's the... Uh, so inside every chapter, Here's the electron orbital. One can see that there's a 
uh, video of the issue. And then the important thing that I want to get over to you is that in every chapter, there is the uh, a video, a short video for one to uh, play and listen to. And then I have here, like for instance, there's four questions here, and it talks about the actual subjects that we've just been discussing, uh, like the electron in the outermost electron orbital is called, it's actually the uh, valence electron. And hey, Mon, we're, we're seeing your slides, not the, not the course website. Oh, you're not. Oh, that's strange. Thanks for telling me that. You're, you're just, you're not on the course. No, we're just seeing the slide that says you can enroll here for the course. And you're. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, we see the initial URL. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for telling me that. So, let me. So in Zoom, are you familiar with um, uh, the button on the sound? Uh, yes, I am. I thought I had actually put that on. So if I stop sharing for a second, so I'll stop sharing. Oh, I've got myself into this. Oh, look, I'll go back. I don't know why this is happening. Ah, oh, this is what I wanted. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we see the site now. All right, thank you very much. I think it was George who told me that. Thank you for that. So here's the actual um, course. So all I've done is click that uh, opening button and gone to the course here. And one can easily scroll down through all the chapters that I highlighted before. And one can choose anyone. Uh, and I just went to the subatomic electron orbit. Which one qubit can represent two of them. And then every time you bring a qubit on, they're all interconnected and they're all entangled. Isn't that so again, there is a video. Beneath the video are the questions and beneath the questions are the research links. So that way, what I'm doing is having an engaging conversation in the lecture and then asking uh, basic but important questions on the topic and then giving these links which people can then go uh, follow up, which I think for the new user is really important. So with the uh, decelerate, so, just like a, a, a moving body will gradually. So no need to go through all the videos, but we can see here on the left hand side, again, all the different chapters, uh, which I mentioned before. So what I like to do is now um, talk about these. So now you've seen how the course is laid out. Here are, uh, I'll just go through in a little bit of depth each area. So are you guys looking at chapter four at the moment? Can you see that? We see a question that says, how can we best define a qubit? 
Okay, I'm not really sure why that um, has happened, but not to worry, I'll just stop sharing for a second. Okay, so are we back on the slideshow? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so now you've seen the actual course and the way that's laid out. I will discuss, give an overview of each subchapter here within the chapter and then talk about the additional points that I mentioned before, which uh, I think you'll find really uh, useful. So, uh, the beginning of the quantum computing side of it, again, short, sharp topics that I think are important, and then uh, an, an overview of them. So, we have the electron orbitals that I was mentioning before. So, the actual atom is given either by heat or radiation is, is um, produces two electron orbitals. <clears throat> you can have many, many orbitals, the outside orbital being uh, the valence orbital, but it gets down to uh, two orbitals, the ground state and the excited state, and that's how all quantum computation is done. So, you know, you have the two orbitals, rather like uh, the Earth going around the Sun is the way I normally explain it. Now, when they are actual particles, they have real probabilities. Before they've been measured and when they're a superstition, they're in a mixture of both orbitals and they cannot be located. And that's the whole basis behind superposition. Um, Boolean logic and probability. Now, Boolean logic is your true and false, where, where the gates come from, which, which allows you to do uh, computations like that. It always seems so easy at first, but when you get into Boolean logic, it's, it's very complex. Uh, probability, you've got probability and in the uh, classical world, we have probability. So if someone said there's a 30% chance of rain, we know there's a 70% chance that it won't rain. And it's always positive real numbers. Whereas in the quantum world, we have complex amplitudes as, a, as the uh, probabilities. <coughs> Excuse me which can be minus, they can be negative, and they can be the square root of whatever. And, and we can represent that with complex, uh, as you can see, complex and imaginary numbers. So the reason why we use complex and imaginary numbers is to denote superposition. And I try not to bombard the student with all of that. So the takeaway point is that we have this phenomenon called superposition and amazingly we can actually uh, simulate superposition we can code it in by using complex and imaginary numbers you know which is an absolutely amazing feat uh, and it was the forethought of Richard Feynman for us to be able to do that so then I talk about the single qubit and the gates that are coming from there and then uh, how multiple qubits and that's basically entanglement starts allowing us to the reason why quantum computing is exponential is that entanglement links them all together so you can have these qubits and every time you add on another qubit 
you are doubling your processing power, which isn't the case in um, digital computing. And that's the whole um, uh, uh, amazing thing that when you're adding on another qubit, you're actually doubling the number of states that you could represent. And, and that, you know, we can map to uh, all of the states. And when we get 300 qubits all entangled, we have so many states that we can actually map to every atom in the observable universe because it's basically the number two to the exponent 300. You know, you've got five squared, two is the exponent. And if you've got two to the 300, 300 being the exponent is actually a, a huge number. And I explain that with the grains of rice um, fable from India where um, Somebody invented the game of chess. Everybody in India loves chess, and they were saying, uh, or it could be the Middle East, actually. I'm not sure which country. But they basically said, you can repay us by, um, they wanted to, the king wanted to give a gift to the inventor, and he said, just give me a grain of rice on the first square, and then double it, and double it again, on all the remaining squares. And the king of thought it wasn't, uh, it was a very, small gift but of course exponentially it ends up being uh, all the rice in the world 20 times over so i explain how through the mystery of entanglement uh, we can entangle uh, superimposed qubits all as if it's the one qubit basically it's allowed to create all these different states. And I also mentioned, as I did in the first session, that um, it's like um, how many, uh, if you've got a table with 10 settings, so you've got a table with 10 people at that table, how many different you know, permutations of those 10 people, how many different place settings can you set up? Nobody ever gets this right, but the number is 3.6 million. And again, that's because we think linearly, but in the universe, it's actually a, an exponential growth. So, you know, with only 10 placings, you've got 3.6 million options. And that's why it's so difficult to do things like uh, vaccination and medicine. Because when you use a vaccination, what it's basically doing is just having a, what's called a ligand that transfers electrons within the actual, at a cellular level. But as soon as you've got 10 electrons, you've got 3.6 million different ways that um, these electrons can be swapped. So it's, yeah, it's amazing. Now, Iman, can I ask you a bit of a yes, philosophical question? So this is on the, the topic of uh, thinking linearly versus thinking exponentially. Um, in, in your view, do you, is it, do you think that's a matter of that's how we've taught ourselves and that we might naturally be able to think exponentially, but just uh, by our experience, we have kind of re removed our ability to think exponentially. Um, yes, that's an interesting question. Um, our brains technically are capable of so much more than we use them for. So our, our brains, which our, our brain itself is an, exp an exponential processing um, organism. It actually processes exponentially. If it processed linearly, we would, we would soon uh, be taken back. So, but our, our minds and our capacity for mathematics uh, 
I think is naturally linear. I don't think we could process information exponentially. Uh, I don't think it's something we've uh, blocked out or been uh, indoctrinated into thinking linearly, which we certainly are. But I don't think we have the, even though our brain has the capacity possibly to do things like that, I, I don't think that uh, we're, we're naturally uh, exponential processing entities. But uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong there. So uh, Deutsch's problem I'm going to talk about later. Uh, Deutsch's problem, I think, uh, and I stress this in the course, is, is, is really the most important process to understand. And I give a good link there to a great YouTube uh, video on, on, on Deutsch's problem that basically allows something, a super digital computer, no matter how big and how many transistors and circuits it has, no matter what, cannot, cannot achieve what Deutsch's does. And I talk about Shores. I actually, during my um, chapter on Shores, I say that for the last couple of years, the largest number we could factor was uh, 15, which I've realized that's going back to 2014, which even so is only six years ago. But when I tell you about Smolin Smith, and Varkov, it's, you know, we, we've now, in the space of six years, gone from 21, or at the most a, a five-digit number, to a 20,000-digit number. And this has only occurred very recently. So I will give you a link to the paper. Um, make sure I do that, Terrell. And it's, it's great reading, and it's completely revolutionized Shaw's. And I like this because, number one, it, again, is the ingenuity of man. So whilst we're waiting for, I mean, um, the problem with quantum computers that I talk about in the course is noise and decoherence. So the fact that because the quantum computer, even though it can produce mind-boggling computations, it's very, very fragile, which is why most quantum computers, I, I notice a lot of them now are talking about operating at room temperature, but like the diamond, um, diamond vacancy um, can operate at room temperature, but most quantum computers have to operate at millikelvin, so just above absolute freezing, to reduce the noise and the interaction of the electron with its environment. And um, that's why, you know, we're, I hate to use the term, we're a long way off, but we are a long way off from Shaw's, for example, uh, Peter Shaw himself says, uh, you know, that we need multiple pure working qubits to be able to perform Shaw's in the way that it would crack RSA. And RSA is the encryption that 95% of the internet uses. Um, during the course, during this section, I talk about an ATM, an automatic tell machine, FPOS. I don't know what you call them in the States, but um, the fact that when you put your card in to make a, a FPOS transaction, that transaction could be uh, hacked into, because every transaction you put your personal uh, identity, your PIN number in, and, sorry, your PIN, not your PIN number. You put your PIN in, 
it encrypts the, it goes into a hash tag and then encrypts the message with RSA, sends it to the bank, the bank decrypts it and says it's okay. Now, a super digital computer of today, like the IBM Oak Ridge, fastest digital computer, it could hack into that message and it could get your pin, but it would literally take it a thousand million years. So you're safe, so everybody on the planet is safe. But um, Schultz algorithm running on a pure quantum computer could break that code in six seconds. So we're a long way from that, and I always stress that, but that's the sort of thing and the sort of processing that we can do. And it's a bit like um, the question before that we were talking about, can we process things exponentially? Um, you know, this, the cracking of RSA, which is factoring, so that's why I bring you back to factoring, and factoring is just where you have a number that there are two prime numbers. Uh, you're given a number and you work out the two prime numbers. It's something a computer can't do or does very, very badly. If you ask a super digital computer to multiply two 20 digit numbers together, it will do it immediately and it'll say, here it is. But if you give it a number and say, what are the two primes? It can't do it. So that's what Shaw's does. So Shaw's uses, oh, I'm explaining this a bit more than I intended to, but never mind, it's good stuff. Shaw's uses um, a thing called the modular series. Um, now, our mathematics, the digital world is based on binary, which is modular too. Our mathematics generally is decimal, that's modular 10. And just to explain it a bit, we have the clock system, which is modular 12. So what happens is it's you, you go up to 12 and then you start again. And that's what happens if it's, for instance, 10 o'clock in the morning and I say add 5 on. Well, it's not 15 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's 3 modular 12. So 15 equals 3 modular 12, and the 3 is the remainder. And some great mathematicians, including Euclid, going back a couple of thousand years, Euler, E-U-L-E-R, found out that there's a huge relationship with the modular and the remainder. And from that is how, an extension from that, is how Shaw's works to find the prime factors. And then the other algorithm that's only been around for about a year, the Smolin one, actually reduces it further, which I know you're gonna love. And then I talk about Grover's, and Grover's is basically, I always use the yellow pages. So if you want to find your number in, uh, or a phone number in the yellow pages, and if the yellow page is all mixed around, uh, is all jumbled up, Grover's will find it. And um, I obviously don't go into the way it finds it, with, which is something Matthew Vasavi did in one of these Quantum Appalooza um, courses that I thoroughly recommend. He did a three session workshop, which I've replayed to myself countless times. Um, and then I talk about those types of qubit there. Uh, I very quickly talk about Microsoft and IBM. As I mentioned before, Microsoft have QShop. They have a simulator so that you can simulate your own programs. And then IBM uh, has the Q experience, which is a real quantum computer. Okay, so let me talk now. Yeah. This will, I'll talk about this for about a quarter for now, these three different areas. So, um, 
the mayor, the mayor on the Fermian, the Deutsches problem, and Shaw's algorithm. Now, the Majorana is uh, the uh, Microsoft's topological qubit, which in many ways is, uh, I think we all know there's a hardware race going on, where the, uh, because qubits can be represented in different ways. They can be um, photons, which are, you know, photonic. You've got your ion trap. Um, you've got your superconductive qubits, which is the main one now. We're up to at least uh, when quantum supremacy, which I mentioned in the course, when that was reached last year, it was on a superconductive qubit uh, of 55 qubits. Um, the Sycamore um, com quantum computer uh, which was a collaboration between Google and NASA. But all these, uh, you know, so we're up to 55, but I know we've gone beyond that now. Whereas the topological qubit is down to still about six qubits. But Microsoft has followed this technology, so the topological qubit, and the main reason is because of the Majorana fermion. So that's a particle, a subatomic particle, that incorporates its own antiparticle. And what I'd like to mention here is that it's a very romantic story, actually, about Ettore Majorana, who in about the 1930s, the mid-1930s, postulated that this fermion must exist. Even now, it's exceptionally rare to... Um, to locate the mayor on the Fermin. It was only about a, a year or so ago that they started being able to manufacture them, if you like, put them together. Um, and uh, Ettore said it must exist. He actually went on holiday and never came back. And there's lots of subplots that he was... Um, kidnapped by whichever race you want to say, he will do the kidnapping, but he was never seen of again, and no one really knows what happened to poor Ettore, but that's what he left us with, and that's the road Microsoft is going down. So the reason why I really want to highlight that now is that even though everything in this race is about scalability, so Microsoft may be, let's say, a bit behind at the moment in the number of qubits and, and the success they're having. But there's going to be a whoosh forward at some time because the Majorana allows far less noise than any of the other technologies. So that's the point I wanted to get over there. Um, now, Deutsch's problem... I, I, there's a, a video that I refer to on the course that really explains it. I'd love to have just shown you that video, but it goes on for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and really would take up uh, nigh on the whole session. Um, the Deutsch's problem just shows that the quantum computers are capable of doing many processes at the same time. Now, I'm not talking multi-processing, where it's still linear, but linear at such a speed that one stops and the other starts, and it, it gives the impression of um, multi-processing, which, which it isn't really. But the quantum computer actually, and through superpositioning, can actually perform two processes at the same time, literally. And um, I do recommend it highly, because for me, uh, Deutsch, is, and Deutsch is David Deutsch, um, still alive. I love saying this to people, because most of the people in quantum computing are all still alive. <laughs> you know, Peter Shaw and Grover, um, I hope Grover's still alive, but they're, 
um, Peter Shaw certainly is, and David Deutsch uh, out of the University of Cambridge certainly is. And he's, um, um, his problem is the foundational problem that empirically shows and explains how um, it's like magic, how when you're only allowed to do one process, a quantum computing uh, computer can do a series of processes at the same time. So I, I recommend having a look at that. Now let's get on to the shores. And this is something I'm very excited about because it's very, very important for the financial industry. Shores, as I mentioned before, is a factoring algorithm. And the importance of factoring is in cryptography because um, RSA is a uh, ubiquitous encryption uh, system that uses the public key, private key. Uh, and actually uh, uses factoring to uh, encrypt the data. And in fact, the beauty of factoring, it's uh, a thing called a P versus MP issue, where multiplying two numbers together is very easy. Knowing what, given the number and working out the two numbers that multiply together equal that number uh, is very, very difficult. And it's a um, system called, a process called P versus MP, where you'll actually get a million dollars if you can work out how to um, get the factors from a number as easily as multiplying two numbers together. But the important thing that just you know, four or five years ago, quantum computers could only factor a very small number. I think they've got to 143, but it doesn't really matter. It, uh, if we look um, this year at the 2020 Q to B conference, it was only a uh, three, six, nine, twelve, a thirteen-digit number. But since the Small and Smith and Vargo compiler, which compiles Shores, we've now gone to uh, a twenty thousand-digit number. And I love this because quite often, uh, number one, it's using man's ingenuity to circumvent the fact that we haven't got pure quantum computer, computers at the moment. But I love this industry because we are constantly saying, oh, this is a long way off. And I've seen it many times where it then becomes real. And you can take quantum supremacy, whether or whether it's not been achieved. There's a, um, a dichotomy of opinion of whether it's been achieved or not, but that's irrelevant really, because that's a definition of super quantum supremacy. Um, so, and quantum, oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. I was gonna. I was. Uh, I've. I've been digging a little bit on this, and uh, unfortunately, I think the joke is on us with uh, the Q two B conference. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I hate to be a bearer of bad news. So no, the, that's okay. Is this yeah. a mayor? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, oh, I even recognize your voice. How are you? Good. Uh, enjoying, enjoying you, you covering all this. So uh, the the reason it's tongue in cheek, but it's it's kind of buried a little bit. So okay. I think it points to the fact that yeah, if you can publish a paper on the archive and you can reference it and you can uh, write a blog post that. Um, uh, someone might just pull the headline, um, but if, if you dig into the details, the reason why they're making a joke about the actual, like they say that they were able to solve this large prime number factoring with only two qubits. Yes. And the reason why they can do that is because the period is two, meaning that it, it, even though the numbers are incredibly large, that yes. uh, 
it's not complex to factor because there the period is so short so there in in a convoluted joke they're basically saying that yeah we can use a 2 qubit computer or just flip a coin and we have our answer so i just wanted to to say that it's it our community is great but it, there's also a bit of like this is kind of a sick joke if you didn't dig into uh like um i yeah if you hadn't like looked at the the pdf that's there and that they're just saying that like the factoring is only important if you are factoring uh numbers with large periods because finding that period is is the difficult part so in actuality there is this is almost like an april fool's joke it didn't um yeah, if you look, uh, Craig, who wrote this blog post, he writes it on April 1st. So I just wanted to throw uh, that out there. And uh, it's a little unfortunate because, um, yeah, it's it's dressed up in a way that you might actually believe that there was a big breakthrough uh, in this case. Uh, I mean, thank you for that. I, I have read a bit about that. You, you're not oh. Let me ask you, you're not referring to Small and Smith and Vargo, are you? Yeah, so the paper, the archive paper you're, you're referencing, the 1301-707, that actually is from 2013. Oh. Yeah, and what it saw, says at the top, it's, it says pretending to factor large numbers on yes. a quantum computer. Yes, let's actually, yeah, oh. Okay, so, I thought you were talking about the conference. Um, oh, no, no, yeah, so I think, oh, I don't know exactly about the conference, but I think the reason for the blog post is that yes. Craig, Craig, who's work, who works at Google, he's saying that um, the conference mentioned that they had factored this long, this large number and pre-compiling yes. it down to three qubits, but the only reason why they can do it on three qubits is because they the already because the period is small and they already know the period so uh yeah yeah, so it's, okay. it's, yeah it's a little and i don't know if the q2b conference if that was meant to be a joke or meant to be legitimate but either way like that's not impressive because the period is so sh small like you would you could do that you would find that period classically also just as fast it's when the periods get really large that discovering them becomes difficult. Well, thank you very much for that, Amy. And um, sure. uh, can, can you guys, uh, can you see my screen at the moment with pretending to factor large numbers? I only see your slides. Uh, okay, so I'm going to have to do the... Yes, sir, having had a look at at those papers yeah. while you've been talking as well, I agree with Amir. Uh, Amir is right, and um, there's no question. It's because we knew the period. I oh, thank you, David. Thank you for that. I had um, seen. Oh, that's a, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Really, <laughs> big shame. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know why I can't get to that. Um, right. Are you guys still looking at these uh, slide at the moment? Or you're probably not. So we can see you again. So oh, right. Um, Look, I've actually finished the presentation because that was the end of it. And Mia, thank you very, very much for uh, interceding there because I had read um, the, the practical joke type thing and I thought it referred to that one billion number, but I see exactly what you're saying. The period is, is uh, the Im important thing. Um, and if you know the period to start with, it, it um, which is the relationship between the the modular series remainder and how it will repeat itself over a period. And that number is normally huge. And 
yeah, the, uh, so unfortunately, the Smell and Smith and Vargo compiler seems to be a bit of a furphy. But, um, oh, do we have um, any questions in general? Or, or we can carry on with that if, um, uh, if, if you so wish. Well, just to point out one more thing, and again, this is just in me skimming the papers while you've been talking. The, well done. I mean, so it seems like one of the points that they're actually making, which is an important one, is that in a way, all of those actual experiments that have been done on real quantum computers to date, all have used knowledge of the pre-compilation, or in other words, knowledge of the period, to yes. enable it to happen on current hardware. And effectively they're saying, yes, that therefore demonstrates the capabilities of current hardware, but it doesn't really show or prove full factorization capabilities because I, you've got to I do that hear. without knowing the period to start with. Oh, I, yes. So David, I wonder what is the largest number we can factor using Shaw's um, without doing the period cheat, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, so not sure. I haven't delved into that question. But looking at these papers, they actually have a whole lot of references to, to the current literatures. So with a bit of effort, I'm sure we could work it out. Yeah, I'd like to know that. I think, I think it's important to know. So. Unfortunately, it is a long way off then. I thought it was um, we were going to be closer. And Mia, do you have, uh, if you can still hear me, do you have any idea what the largest um, number we can factor in a genuine process on a quantum computer using chores? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um... I think because Shores requires uh, like a larger depth circuit that it keeps the numbers pretty small. Um, and uh, so I, I was looking on Stack Exchange why this number came up from that conference. And it's, uh, there's actually another algorithm that came out called variational quantum factoring. Um, variational. Yeah. And that's that I think that was where that number came from and they were saying with classical preprocessing that yeah this variational factoring algorithm could work but um, but I guess with any of these large numbers the point is um, if they happen to have a small period then um, then that's not that wouldn't be uh, that would still be a uh, accessible from a classical computer. So, uh, yeah, I don't, the, to answer your question, I don't know the largest number, um, but that's, I do know that Shores has some overhead and that's why we're limited in terms of how much, how, how, what, what numbers we can actually factor with, with that algorithm. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I've heard Peter Shaw saying the same thing. When you listen to him speak, he's um, he's very circumspect about the whole thing, isn't he? He's very um, hey, it's a long way off, guys. It's 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 not around the corner, and um, maybe that's where it is. Uh, Terrell, are you there? Yes, sir. Excellent. Look, I've um, um, I'd like to thank. Um, Amir and David for um, their, their points there, which are very, very valid. And uh, look, I've finished the presentation, so um, if there are any questions, obviously happy to answer them. But th this course, of course, is, a, is for a beginner, so we've um, meandered away into uh, very complex subjects, <laughs> as we will, which was a lot of fun, and we should continue this talk and somehow we should, uh, because Shaw's is such a pivotal algorithm, I think we should somehow keep um, 
that information going between us so that we understand exactly uh, how uh, how real and how close we are to doing something uh, of a practical nature with Shores. I think it's a long way off. We yes, don't I, have, right. I mean, we, we don't have, you know, physical qubits that match the lo logical qubit needs. So just right there, just, yeah. I, you know, I think uh, Amir yeah. and others are probably no better, but it's, what, a thousand to one or something like that? Thousand physical qubits to one, whatever. You know, it's, it's yeah. ridiculously large, so. I uh, think so one of the go. more recent papers I've read, which was also by the, that Craig Gidney, um, where he came up with an algorithm that needed, I think it was 20,000 qubits yeah. to yes. factor. So those of um, you who are new to the space, one of the best kept secrets, or let's say the elephant in the room, I guess might be appropriate when, when, a technology company talks about a qubit in their computer, let's say a five qubit computer or a 10 qubit quantum computer, um, the, those qubits are very, very noisy. There's a, a tremendous amount of error in there. So, you know, uh, to, to, to create a, a error-free qubit, like the error-free bits we're accustomed to classical classical computing, uh, we can accommodate errors in a qubit by having, you know, doing software tricks. Uh, but those software tricks require a ton of physical qubits. So the point is that, uh, you know, we talk about physical qubits in a machine, like IBM has 50 qubits, let's say, but, you know, it's, they're full of errors. And if you do an exercise, when you get into it, and you do an exercise of some of the simplest things you could imagine, uh, you get tremendously, I don't want to say random, but you get, uh, uh, you know, a distribution of answers that just doesn't make sense. Uh, so, so, you know, even if we did have a 2000 qubit machine and, and, you know, D-Way, well, D-Way is a different animal, but 2,000 uh, qubits still won't be very useful. If they're physical qubits, if they're logical qubits, that's a different story. Jamie, it looks like you got a hand raised here on this issue. Yeah, that's me. Sorry, it took me a second to hop on my uh, mic here. Um. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I just wanted to say a couple of things real quick. I'm, I think I've heard that the record using Shor's algorithm, I mean, I think there's ways that you can use quantum annealing with D-Wave, which I'm not as familiar with, where you can factor bigger numbers. But I believe using the kind of like superconducting qubits that most people are used to, um, it's either 15 or 21. Um, I think 15 was back in like 2001 when they factored that. Um, but yeah, there's just like Amir was saying, there's just a lot of overhead with Shor's algorithm. Just kind of takes a lot to get that going. Um, so I think David and, and and people were talking about uh, using about 10 or 20,000 qubits. Um, at, and I think what we need, I actually had the fortunate, um, I, I saw Craig Gidney talk once in person uh, at a architecture conference in Arizona. And uh, he presented some kind of theoretical um, progress where if you used about 10 or 20,000 logical qubits, um, you could start breaking RSA. That's just the logical qubits. You would need additional qubits for physical qubits for uh, quantum error correction. So um, kind of at the level of error that we have right now, we have like 99.9% um, good qubits, you're looking at about 10 million physical qubits that you would need um, wow. right to break, break RSA with Shor's algorithm. Um, so I, I'd have to like do a little research and pull up the actual papers, but I know they've made some progress because 
it was actually worse than that before they got to that. But uh, yeah, they were doing some work on the theory, which is over my head, but uh, they were at about 10 million physical qubits and then we, we could break our RSA. Yeah, so that's the archive paper 1905.09. Actually, I'll just type it in here. That's amazing, yes. I think, um, Terrell, this is a great subject for a future lecture, possibly by Jamie and me or David. Um, I, I, I think it's in some ways um, epitomizes our, our industry, our sector. So when we're talking about figures like that, it's... Um, it's 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 something we should all keep up to date on. Yeah, I I don't worry about detail like that. I just know it's a hell of a lot more than we have today, so I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. You know, whether it's ten thousand or a hundred thousand, I don't really care at this stage <laughs> of the game. <laughs> well, Personally. you don't you don't worry about very much at all in life, do you, Terrell? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, nah, not at all. No, life's too short. <laughs> okay, but yeah. the really important thing, or the the point that you made, human, um, is while the current state of the quantum computing art is limited qubits and that they're all noisy, it's up to all of us to use our brains to try and think of and come up with clever algorithms and tricks even to enable useful results to come out of the current state of the art. And I mean, well, that's what lots of people are trying to do, uh -huh. arguably with limited success so far, but we're all trying. I just, I just wish the hardware guys would get, guys and gals would get their act together. So, yeah, um, same here. Yeah. Although <laughs> funnily enough, um, like when I talk to or the software people, then we all say, hey, it would be great to have more qubits and better quality, etc." But when yeah. you talk to the hardware people, they say, oh, well, it would be great if the software people could come up with better algorithms and come up with better ways of compiling the algorithms onto yeah. the hardware. It's, so, it, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. As I, I've, I mentioned somewhere along the line, you know, I just, I'm fascinated about, you know, classical computing was basically done in sequential order, roughly. And, and you know, you accomplish one thing is, and basically we said, okay, well, what's next? Okay, well, you know, uh, we'll, we'll create machine language. And, okay, we got that. That's, that's a pain to do next. So let's, let's create assembler language, right? Okay, that works for a while. Now that's a pain in the neck, so let's start climbing the, the chain there. But here, you know, we have a, a um, mutual dependency on each other. And, you know, if both of us come through, meaning the software and the hardware, guys and gals, bingo. If one of us fails, well, go into quantum sensing. I don't know. That's what makes it kind of interesting to me, frankly from a sociology perspective, so. Yeah, well, and the quantum sensing, I mean, they definitely have current practical applications where it's working already. Yeah, wise guys, <laughs> not fair. They're making money while we're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, the quantum sensing, I, you know, uh, I'd like to get some more talks on that sort of thing. Yes, uh, because definitely. it is such a, you know, it's a great backup plan if you're into quantum, you know, like cold quanta and that, that kind of stuff. I think that would be uh, good. Uh, speaking of that, <laughs> I, I booked a speaker the other day, some of you probably saw it, uh, uh, who will talk about the, uh, what do we call it, trans compilation or whatever. So where you, you take a, a what we would call a logical gate and they break it down into the machine level instructions, you know, uh, the quantum machine level instructions. We got that talk coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. I think that'll be really interesting. That That's an unusual talk. I haven't seen anybody actually speak about that in public. Uh, 
That that's really be interesting. good. Yeah, yeah. That'd be, that'd be fun. Um, you know how a Hadamard gate gets converted into actual quote unquote control instructions. I guess is the word for it. I don't know. And can, but, uh, what's the name of the speaker for that one, Tell? Can you remember? Or? Uh, no, I don't. My memory doesn't go that far. Uh, <laughs> no. It's, yeah, it's I, okay. We'll I, I just emailed him like, you know, we exchanged emails like two days ago. Uh, yes. Just check Quantum Appalooza or go to the Harrisburg meetup site, which I'll do right now. Because um, it is an interesting talk. I, you know, I just haven't seen it elsewhere. Uh, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, there's also that nano satellite, a book to somebody to talk about quantum uh, nano satellites. So she'll uh, she'll be talking about that. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, quantum key distribution on cube stat uh, satellites, uh, nano satellites, and that's July 23rd. The control statements is oh yeah, both of them are on the same day. So the control statements is 7:15 in the evening, and the uh, cube stat satellites is at 2:30 uh, in the afternoon. Uh, New York time on July 23rd. So two two interesting, you know, two different ones. I'll put it that way. Two different ones in one day. Oh, terrific! Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, yeah, I got some more. Yeah, there's up. a you, you've been having a, a nice variety of different topics, Carol. So yeah, is is it working? If yeah, it's I think so. definitely yeah. working. Yeah. Well, well, and it leads to interesting conversations as we've been having. Well, that's you guys' fault, not mine. <laughs> I can't help it, man. You know, you guys just, you guys and gals just take it to wherever you want to take it, <laughs> wherever you want to go. It's not, it's not what I intend. You know, we could be talking about satellites and you guys talking about qubits. No, I mean, that's a good thing. It's a right uh, but uh, yeah, if, uh, by the way, you know, if there's some topics that, or a person writes a paper, uh, you know, I'm chasing one guy down now, I wrote a paper about, you know, quantum education and stuff. Um, so I'm chasing him down. But if you find some papers that are, that are, um, you know, of interest, uh, you know, we'll get the, either let me know, or you just reach out to the person and say, do a talk. And just pick a date and we'll, I'll, I'll take care of the logistics if you want. It's not a problem at all. Uh, we got a a series coming up of uh, around 20, 25 speakers in uh, October, November on the quantum master's degrees. Uh, that one, some of you may be interested in, or at least know people who are interested in. So we, yeah. there's roughly uh, 25 uh, master programs in quantum computing around the world. and. Uh, I've talked to uh, 19 of them so far, and they've all agreed to do a talk, you know, not at one time. Uh, so there'll be a series in either September or October. I haven't figured out exactly when yet. But that'll be interesting because uh, uh, the quantum programs, the, deg the deg degrees are all different. They all have different focus. Um, you know, some of them are heavy on optical. Some of them are heavy on engineering. Ones like Harrisburg are, are more, you know, broad-based. Uh, so all of these programs, not one of them is, is the same as the other, which is kind of cool. Uh, also working on, I'll, I'll announce it now, I'm working on a project called uh, the Quantum Swashbuckle. I'll just leave it to your imagination. Yes. So that'll be, that'll be a, a big event in the fall, hopefully, if I can get all the pieces together. But, you know, if you find some uh, speakers out there or somebody of interest, you know, send them my way and I'll ping them or you ping them, you know, at all levels. Definitely. So, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, at all levels, right? So, personally, um, and I guess we'll let the, I'll get off the microphone here, but I know. I personally, I, I really enjoy the learners, the people who are learning uh, more than the professionals, because usually the professionals are talking over my head, so I don't understand a word they say. Um, but uh, 
but you know, I'm trying to get like college students and stuff. Like we had uh, um, a student from University of Utah give a just a terrific talk on. Um, anybody remember what he talked about? <laughs> um, uh, golly, on on semiconductors. It's just fabulous talk. Very understandable. Uh, but you know, we had a high school. Well, a college freshman speak one time. So, anyway, I'm rambling. So uh, I see Trisha and uh, Chuba. Oh, those I do. I I don't recognize your your name. Are you guys Chuba O oh, and uh, Trisha? Are you new to the quantum community, or have I just missed your name in past events? It's sounding like my class in Denmark. It teaches class in Denmark. I got 50 students, literally 50. And I ask a question, and it'll be just pure silence. You know, <laughs> there's 50 of them. One, somebody <laughs> say something. <laughs> unlike, unlike this crew here, I'm not shy. Cynthia's a little shy. I uh, hardly ever hear from Cynthia. Hint, hint. Prove him wrong, Cynthia. Yeah. There we go. I have, little, I have little to say at this point. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> but if you did have something to say, what would it be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You done, Iman? Oh, yeah, I'm done. Okay. I'm done, done rambling. Two, I was done 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. Call it a All night right. or a day yeah. or a morning. Yes, indeed. Have a good night, folks. Thanks for your thanks for playing. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow, I thanks think we've got a, for speaking. We've got an event tomorrow, by the way, too. Uh, uh, just yeah. Wait a minute. Upcoming. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow, July eighth. Yeah. So tomorrow is, uh, oh, yeah. Um, some of you might have attended Deb's and Helen's uh, uh, Washington Quantum event uh, about two or three weeks ago with Andre uh, Koenig. Uh, he has this, he's developed this data set with lots of data. And, uh, you know, they wanted to do a repeat performance. So uh, that was really interesting, uh, the information he has. Uh, so if you're interested in the ecosystem, uh, that's that'll be tomorrow night, uh, 7 p.m. New York time. Uh, that that that's pretty interesting. He's got a lot of data out there, and also somewhere uh, I guess it's uh, I think it's uh, Quantum Association also has um, Doug Fink back, or giving a presentation in a couple of days. I think if you just check. Quantum Palooza, both of those are very informative, non-technical, but very for informative about the ecosystem. Also, the, uh, July 21st, we've got a, a D-Wave presentation. So those of you who haven't had the opportunity or the time or energy to dig into D-Wave, uh, Alex Kahn, who uh, um, I was originally going to give the talk, but I talked Alex into giving it. Uh, it'll be a very good, you know, level 100 uh, event for the quantum explorer so it should be understandable by anybody uh, we basically took the court the course that we taught the 12 to 16 year olds on D wave and uh, we'll adapt it a little bit for adults but I assure you after that evening you will be able to walk away uh, ready to program the D wave computer if you're not familiar with you know how the annealing works and and uh, and that sort of thing that'll be a, a really good opportunity, a good use of an hour and a half probably, because uh, you'll walk away from there understanding, uh, you know, how one of the D-Wave solvers works. So that would be really, really useful, I think. Anyway, good night, everybody.